As I have said on many previous occasions, it is almost impossible to speak about the holy office or the holy ministry without at the same time talking about the church or ecclesiology. And of course, you cannot talk about either of these without talking about the means of grace or the means of the Spirit, the gospel and the sacraments. The matter became rather urgent in the 19th century, but is just as urgent today. Then we found the Lutherans being in the aftermath of Schleiermacher, his infamous dictum that the church was the gathering of like-minded people. Schleiermacher, for those of you who do not know him, was a theologian who's been called the father of modernism. The church is above all a fellowship, he said. He says in his um, doctrinal uh, teaching of faith that in order to know what the Christian church is, one must first establish the general concept of the church together with a right understanding of what is characteristically Christian. He goes on to say, the general concept of the church, if there is to be such a thing, must be derived from ethics because the church is at all events is a fellowship created by the voluntary actions of men. It's created by the voluntary actions of men. And only through these does it continue to exist. And the fact that he bases in ethics means he bases in law. And we always want things to be based in terms of the gospel. In fact, he says it's based upon the voluntary actions of men, says it's not based upon God's action. And so there came to be in the 19th century a great emphasis amongst the confessional Lutherans on something called um, Anstalt, institution. It's instituted by God, the churches, not by man. But he said it's instituted by man. He goes on, that certainly fire fixes the idea of fellowship. Since the fellowship arises through the voluntary actions of men and continues to exist only through such actions, the church, since it is a fellowship, arises at the same way, that is only through the voluntary actions of men. Pursuing this line, we may go on to say that since the Lord's Supper is a fellowship, the koinonia, and since this term evidently includes both altar and church fellowship, they brought, uh, they're both brought about by the voluntary actions of men, and only through these can they continue to exist, he says. Well, that was the real undoing of all of uh, evangelical Lutheran theology. Of course, he was a Reformed theologian, but uh, he even was shocked at the Reformed, I think. Schleiermacher was kind of the boogeyman of the 19th century to the very beginning. And the church had to react to this. They had to say something. And they had to address the matter. And that's why, as Herman Sasse says, you know, in the, in the 19th century, he says you have the church becoming something of the chief element of the, um, the chief problem with regards to the church. In other words, we have to deal with it in terms of what is going to be the problem there. It's, um, it's the major issue in the 19th century. And he says, in actual fact, it still is today. And he's right. This was all pointed out by Leah, Wilhelm Leah. He stated the situation very clearly in the first sentence of the foreword of his book, Three Books About the Church. Quote, everyone is talking about it. That is about the doctrine of the church. Similarly, Theodor Leclifold, up in the north of Germany, has stated the matter in his eight books on the church. Same way. And so these men pointed out, everybody's talking about this doctrine of the church. But I thought our doctrine was going to be the doctrine of holy ministry. Well, it is, but you cannot talk about the one without the other. You cannot talk about the holy ministry without talking about the church. So it appears that we are destined to begin with an examination of the doctrine of the church. For this, of course, we have no better guide than Hermann Sasse. I should rather add that the name of Norman Nagel, for he has done more than any other man in our church's history to clarify the Lutheran doctrine of the church and of the Holy Office, the Holy Ministry. Sasa states the problem in this way. <clears throat> it had its errors, which made it impossible for a renewal of the Lutheran Church to come from there. Uh, this was uh, in reaction to Schleiermacher. He's talking about one of the chief instruments of the Lutheran renewal in the 19th century. It was the faculty at Erlangen, a small university in, 
in Franconia, northern Bavaria. Franconia was the name of all those places up in Michigan. Frank and Moose, Frank and Lewis, Frank and Trust, Frank and Hilf, they all came from Franconia. And this uh, small university, relatively small, was a great university of Lutheranism. In the 19th century, they had a great faculty that espoused uh, more confessional Lutheranism. But he said they had errors themselves, Sasse says. That was the faculty, by the way, that Sasse had served at when he was in Germany. He said they had their errors that made it impossible for renewal of the Lutheran church to come from there. The fact that they had not been able to keep for itself free from the seductive poison of Schleiermacher's subjectivism. The other error of the airline and theology was uh, to be the fact that they were closely bound to the narrow confines of the Landes, Lutheran Landeskirche in Germany, the territorial church. Similarly, nobody could imagine what the break between Walther and Leah, between Missouri and Iowa, would mean one day. Today we know it, and we must answer the question of whether the union, which did not succeed at that time, is possible today, a century later. And he's talking here about the fact that here we have all these Lutheran theologians in Germany. Some of them are weaker, they're not as, as faithful. They become involved in Schleimacher subjectivism, they call it, the feelings theology. And on the other hand, you have, um, you have Walther and Leah, two great men, two great pastors. And in uh, 1851, they met at Neuendettelsau. That was in Germany where Leah was. And there you thought, well, boy, these two men, they, they had a great, great meeting. They were going very well. And another man from North America called Grabau. He was from the Buffalo Senate. He kind of queered the pitch, as they say in Britain. He uh, came along and he spoke poorly of, of Walther and his men because of their doctrine of the church and the ministry. Now that's one of the things we're going to have to sort out someday is the real grab -out. I think the Missouri Senate began to um, represent him falsely, maybe. And we have to deal with that someday. But anyway, he kind of did this. And it came to the day, to the day when Leah to announce his separation from Missouri, sent them the famous card. Now you still find this in Germany today. When you announce the death of the family, you have a card sent. There's a black border around the whole envelope and then on a sheet that's inside. And he sent one of these black bordered cards to the Missouri Senate announcing the death of their fellowship. A very sad day for him as well as for them. And Sasa here writes this article about the church and, and the congregation, or the, the ministry and congregation, on the anniversary of the founding of the Fort Wayne Seminary, which had been a seminary that had been founded by Leah. He gave it to the Missouri Synod. In actual fact, it had been founded a couple years before Missouri Synod's St. Louis Seminary, but uh, that's another matter. He, um, so the first error, he said, was although it was a great earnest attempt to retain the ob objective truths of the revelation, he said uh, that they followed into the Schleiermachers, fell into his trap of subjectivism. The other error was this uh, bound to the narrow confines of the Lutheran Landeskirche. Now, what does that all mean? In other words, this is an attempt to try to explain where we're at today and why we're here. Um, is very important, I think. The, um, what separated Leah and Walther, Iowa, and Missouri? How shall account for the difference of opinion which centered around the question of polity and which caused schisms within one church against the, again and again? Ever since Leah and Walther severed connections, it's caused many more schisms. It cannot be said that the Lutheran church remained or has remained altogether faithful to the glorious freedom of the Reformation without noticing that the problems have been wrongly put. The Orthodox Fathers and the Fathers of the 19th century did not notice that Luther's Ecclesia Absconditus cannot simply be identified with the Ecclesia Invisibilis of the Reformed Church and instead of taking over the Reformed terminology 
it would have been wiser to have retained the terms used by Luther in the Catholic Confessions. And what he's getting at here is this. When the Orthodox Fathers of the 17th century began to write about the church, they began to use a term that was taken over from the Reformed, Ecclesia Invisibilis, the church invisible. Instead of staying with Luther's terminology, Ecclesia Absconditus, the, the hidden church. Now to us, there may not be a lot of difference there, but there is a lot of difference, really. And he said it would have been much better to have stayed with Luther. The um, terminology that was used by the reform came to Lutheranism chiefly through the pietists. But also there is an unfortunate fact that Walther used this terminology. He was aware that it was reformed. My explanation is the fact that Dr. Walther was a much better theologian than we are today. He's able to avoid the pitfalls of that theology, of that use of that terminology. And we're not. So in a sense, where it's his fault. But uh, here's a way in which the terminology got in the way and it came to be a very negative thing. And therefore, we have a problem with that terminology and what is there in terms of, um, oh, I would say it's a very, uh, well, let me go on. I'll try to explain it later. So uh, this is one of the things in the background. We have this difference of doctrine and the polity went with us. When, for instance, Walter explains in the 1840, uh, Eight presidential address, the first one he gave to the new Senate after it had been formed the previous year. He explained, he says, you know, it's been very unfortunate that we got the polity that we do, which is kind of a, a synodical, congregational polity. It's not strictly a congregational polity. It cannot be. Lutheranism cannot have strict congregationalism. Why not? Because it is a confessional church. Now, what does that mean? On the one hand, you have confessions, that is, we same say one another, we speak together. And congregationalism is almost the opposite. We do not speak with them, we speak on our own. It's very individualistic. And that became a kind of an American phenomenon. It was almost created in America, this congregationalism, by the Puritans. Their idea of the individual before God came to be in their polity as well, congregationalism. Now, during the walkout, there was a lot of emphasis upon the, the congregationalism of our church because every congregation was said to have its own right to, uh, to decide who it's fellowship with. And August Silflo, the director of the CHI, the Concordia Historic Institute at that time said, no, 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 he said, you got it wrong. He said, if you look at our constitution, Article 7, he said, it's not strictly a congregational polity, congregational synodical, in other words, we walk together. And so this is one of the problems we've had, the confusion over that matter. And then you have the matter of, um, well, the Uber Traugans layer. There's a way in which Dr. Walter went on to say that, in actual fact, you don't have the ministry first, you have the church first. If you're going to talk about the egg and the chicken, you have to have the, the egg first. It is the congregation. And they give the ministry to the pastor. He also said that Augustana 5, about the office of the ministry, was an article that was kind of in, in concrete, uh, in abstracto, the doctor of the ministry. Now, let's talk about that and clarify what he means there. After the doctor of justification, they say, now, in order to receive this, you have the doctor of ministry, the word and sacraments. And when Dr. Walter says that's in abstracto, he means it's about the doctrine of holy uh, the means of grace, not about the office of the ministry itself. And yet there's a title there, it's called Predictamt, the uh, Office of Preaching. Well, Dr. Klug of Fort Wayne had said, now he said, that gives away. He said, he said no, he said, that those titles were, were added later, and therefore it doesn't mean that. Now, there are two problems with that. Number one is the fact that in the first place, it was within three years of that being written. If somebody had put that in there, it was unacceptable, they would have said something. But also, within the document itself, it uses the word Predictamt which means the doctrine of preaching, the office of preaching. And so we think that there is truly the office. 
That's one of the things that I think Dr. Walter was a little bit narrow about, if I may say so, dare say so. And so what does that mean? That means that when we come to the matter of church and ministry, the relationship there is one that we have perhaps exaggerated or we have not been very faithful to the loose confessions about. We have allowed ourselves to be taken in by either the subjectivism of a Schleiermacher or even some other type of subjectivism. When Walther writes about uh, these things, he is quoting a lot of Spainer or Spainer's types of quotations where he quotes from. And one of the big things he quotes from is a Reformed theologian named Hartman. He acknowledges that. And that's very poor. Because when you allow a Reformed man to begin to set your agenda, that's very, very dangerous. It's often law-oriented. That's what we have here. And so in terms of this matter, we have, uh, well, it's coming out that uh, it's uh, going to be a reformed teaching in a sense. So what is the situation regarding the connection of the church and the New Testament? The New Testament is, as well as we know, full of thoughts and directions on the ordering of the church. Before the Gospels were even written, there were already church orders such as 1 Corinthians. I guess you would say 1 Corinthians 14, for instance, where it says, oh, let all things be done decently and in order. Is God's will that the church, which is his people, be ordered? For it is not a God of disorder, but of peace. The church, uh, Lutheran church, never concerned, contested this, and the church orders of the time of the Reformation were just now seriously, they, they showed just how seriously they strove to order the church. But the question has is this, has God legally commanded a particular order? That's the big question. We must answer this question in the negative. No, it did not. It is a historic fact that at the beginning of the church's history in the apostolic and post-apostolic ages, there existed various forms of institution. There was the Episcopal deaconate and the presbyteral form. They were there, but they were not ordered by the scripture itself. They were allowed. And uh, this all came to be a, a matter of contest. And today you ask an Anglican, say, uh, why is it so important to have bishops? Is that the essay of the church? Now, admit it's not the essay of the church, the essence of the church, but the essay it's of the plenum essay. That is, it's for the fullness of the church. You don't have complete church unless you have bishops. That's a very good argument, but it doesn't follow in terms of scripture. Now, it was the essay. It's not based upon scripture. Most of them, they based it upon Saint Ignatius, the early father of the church. And so we have here a, an ordering. Calvin, you know, he kept talking about the, the ordering of God's church. He would make it very specific what the order was to be. And the fact that it was God's order, he would say. And that was a presbyterial form of government. A presbytery of, he would have seven elders, uh, ruling elders, and five teaching elders. The five teaching elders were the clergy. And even there, that was very important. Because the five teaching elders were men who would get into the Pope and they would teach about God's word. They were not really there to proclaim God's word. That's why they changed their vestments to the black gown, because that was the academic gown. That was what the men wore in their academic uh, business to mark their office. And they would get up before the people and they would wear that in the pulpit, and that meant that they were there as teachers of the word of God, not proclaimers. And he would always have them pray a prayer before the service sermon, a prayer for the Holy Spirit, to call the Holy Spirit to be there with the Word. And that was called the prayer of the Spirit super added. Now Luther would come on and say, we don't need that prayer. It's God's Word. It's God's word. So if it's God's Word, it's God's Holy Spirit's going to be there. We don't need to call upon Him. In fact, it is the very Word of God. The pastor becomes the mouthpiece of God, Luther says. Just as in baptism, his hand becomes the hand of God. And his hand feeding the people with the bread and body and blood of Christ is the hand of God. He would say it very specifically like that. I've written about that elsewhere in a 
fest shirt for Dr. Kleinig, which is still hush hush, because he hasn't heard about it yet, but it's supposed to be coming out within the year. That uh, Luther talks about the Word of God in the sermon. The sermon is the very Word of God, he says. And that's kind of opposite Calvin's view. And uh, so we have here the fact that in the uh, Augsburg Confession, we have this matter very clearly set out. And so it's very important for us to understand that matter, that God is there in his word. He is there through the pastor. And when God chooses a man for the office, it's God's choosing him. It's not the congregation choosing him. Or well, they do it eventually. There are three things that place a man into the holy office in Lutheranism. His examination, his ordination, and his installation or his call, really. Now, these three things are very important, but uh, in our past history, we've kind of un un undermined one of them, ordination. We had fathers of our Missouri Synod who once claimed that it was merely not the offering. You didn't have to do it. It's not in Scripture, they said. Well, the name is not there, but it certainly is there. And they said it offered no gift from God. All of these things, which I think from Scripture has proved to be wrong. For after all, they... Uh, Ordination was of God. He was there. <laughs> uh, a very clear thing with regards to Paul and Timothy. He said, when we laid hands on you, and the Holy Spirit was given to you, he says, too. And so this was a very unfortunate time in Missouri's history when we so belittled the ordination. Today we still have problems with it. Ordination. Now, the call is very important because it gives location to the ministry. It's an ordination. In other words, the ordination says to the congregation and the people of God throughout the church, this man has the habitus. He has the, the, what it takes to be a pastor of God, people. And you should all know that. So now, and that's addressed to all of Christendom, not just to Lutheranism. That presents another problem with this phenomenon we have today of the specific ordinations for a specific ministry. That's never been the case in Lutheranism. So we have to re-examine that. That means they're going to take men out of specific places and ordaining for ministry in that place and that place alone. He cannot move to another place. But that kind of belittles ordination and its whole purpose. To announce to the whole Christian church this man is, has the habitus to be a pastor of God's people. Now he's got that. Now a congregation comes and calls him to be its pastor. Gives locatedness to that calling. He's now here at this place. And he's there to be disciplined to that place. He has to go off and try to steal people from another man's parish. He has to go try to teach in another man's parish. He has a right publicly in a way that, uh, unless he's a teacher of the church, that's another problem we have today. The Missouri said we've had leaders of our church say, no, you're not leaders, they don't have teachers of the church, but for the church. What does that mean? When Paul in Ephesians 4 talks about some are pastors, some teachers, he means two different offices, according to James Veltz and Dr. Sasa. And these doctrines are the fact that here we have an office in the church that is the teacher of the church, and that is usually assigned to the professors at the at seminary. That we are teachers who now we are called to be teachers, we're given a doctorate. We do not need to ask the permission of the bishop, as Dr. Sass would say, to come and preach in his diocese or teach there. The church has already declared that we have that right. Now that's a very important thing to be discussed and talked about. Because if that's the case, that's why I'm here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Then we're teachers of the church. Or we're here because your pastors have invited us to be here. That's okay. But if uh, they had objected, then I would still have the right to teach here. It's the idea. Now, all this seems to be placing a lot of emphasis upon the man, the person. We have that phenomenon today that we call sacerdotalism. Well, my, my, what a word. What's that mean? I think it means that he becomes priestly, that he becomes like a Roman Catholic priest. He has an authority that has power with it. And that's what we don't like. Americans don't like authority. The bumper sticker of America is question authority. 
When I came back from Britain, I discovered they asked, why? Why? Because in Britain, we had no problem with authority, I guess. Well, that makes you weaker or something. But anyway, the, the authority of God's word, around God's word, Jesus Christ said at the, at the Great Commission, all authority has been given me, and now I'm giving it to you, he said to his disciples. Or that's the case in Matthew 9, where he heals the man in the paralytic. And he says, all authority has been given to me to forgive his sins. And the people marveled that such authority had been given among men. Now that authority has nothing to do with power. That's our problem. We, we confuse doctrine of, we confuse authority and power. And that's not the problem. That's not the case. It's not a matter of power. It's a matter of authority. That as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his ethics, a man is under authority and in authority. And we don't like being under authority because it takes away our control of things. We love to control everything. That's why we don't like authority. But authority is a good thing by God. And so the sacerdotalism, well, there are some pastors, I'm sure, who go around trying to browbeat their congregation members or something like that, but that's not the case. But the fact that we hold out and say, this man has an authority, that's a godly thing, a godly gift to him and the people. For when he gets into the pulpit, he should be a man who speaks with authority. And when he lectures, when he talks and teaches the children, he should be a man who teaches with authority, as Jesus was said to do. That means they know that what he's saying is truly God's word and God's gift to them. And so the office of the ministry is the office which gives gospel. That's its main purpose and the authority of it. He gives the gospel. That's what it's for, and that's why it's there. It's the office of the gospel. It's the uh, belonging together. The office exists to give the gospel. It's a remarkable thing. In August 10, 5, it says, the continuation in the sins, in order that we may obtain such faith, God has given us this Holy Spirit, Scripture. And... Christ did not leave behind a book for his church alone in the way that Muhammad left the Qumran, the Quran. And Christ rather gave his office of preacher, proclamation to the gospel for preaching the office, the spoken word, as Schwabach Article 7 says, which is the predecessor of this Article 5 in the Augsburg Confession. It's by Luther. He said there, he said, uh, the preaching office of the spoken word. Let us remember that for Luther, at least in his early period, Holy Scripture is really, really the Old Testament. <laughs> now, there are some people who say the Old Testament ministry has nothing to do with the New Testament. Paul Schrieber, a colleague of mine, wrote an excellent article in, the, in our journal some years ago to show that that was wrong. There's a very direct link between the Old Testament office and the New Testament. Thus it is, uh, thus it alone has this name that means a holy writing. And the gospel should not really be a written writing, but an oral word, Luther says. Therefore also Christ himself wrote nothing, but only spoke and did not call his teaching scripture, but gospel is a good message or proclamation which must be delivered not with a pen, but with a mouth. And that's got to be understood correctly. Luther's not condemning Scripture. He's not belittling Scripture. He's very much in favor of it. But he's just trying to give this balance. The three things that are the Word of God. Number one is the Christ himself. He is the Logos of God. Number two is the Scripture. Number three is the proclaimed Word by the preacher. So Luther makes a distinction between the, the office of preacher and the office of pastor even. And the office of preacher is the highest office, even higher than that of pastor. Now at his time, there were a lot of priests who would go around. They were only ordained to do sacraments, not to preach. He condemned that practice very highly. He says, denies them the highest office, that of preaching to the people. And even in, in uh, Wittenberg, the Marian Kirk, the main church where he preached often, came to be called the Preaching Church. You kind of wonder, well, weren't they all preaching churches? I don't think so. No. 
So it's the essence of the gospel is that he wants not only to be have it be read, but also plainly preached and heard. Only in this way does it meet faith and, and exercise power over the spirits. A mission which is satisfied with sending the word of God in the form of a printed Bible to the heathen who are to be converted, who would quickly suffer shipwreck. There are two fundamental truths in which the beginning of Article 5 brings to our awareness which we must always have in view if we are to understand Lutheran doctrine of the office of the ministry. The doctrine of the office of the ministry is inseparably connected with the doctrine of uh, justification. And God willed, God's willed the justifying faith be awakened by and the oral preaching of the word. That's the way he talked about it. And so... Uh, this is a very important matter of, of how we come to hear the, what the pastor is there for. They are to be a living example of God's presence in our midst. They are to be his spokesman, his mouthpiece. That's very important for us to understand and hear from him. Sasa wrote other words. He wrote about uh, the ministry in the early church, about the office of teacher in the early church, as I said before. It was a very important thing for him to clarify for us. And uh, the fact that he, he spoke in the way that he did began to make some Missouri St. Lutherans very nervous, as you can imagine. In fact, today it's almost ironic that uh, there's a newspaper in our church that uh, talks down about these Euro, uh, hyper Euro Lutherans. There's the men who seem to follow Leah and Cleefote and Filmar about the Holy Office in the 19th century rather than Walther. And then they, or the editor of that journal is also very high on one of the, the greatest uh, hyper Euro Lutherans in the world, that is Herman Sassi. I think he's, if you want to be called a, a hyper Euro Lutheran, then you have to call Dr. Sassi one. But I don't think uh, Sassi was able to critique Filmar, Cleefold, and Leo on the Holy Word. He was able to say uh, that their view of the doctrine office was not perfect in many ways. And yet he appreciated it very much. He hoped that Iowa and Missouri might be able to be brought together about this, and that they might be able to con con trade one another out, as it were. So uh, this whole matter of external church government, then, is a matter that we must address also. It's a matter of uh, sorting that out. And in the office, the holy office, we often talk about the holy ministry today, instead of the holy office, nothing wrong with that. But when we talk about the public office, or the public ministry, it's as if we want to get away from calling it holy. I don't know if that's the case or not. That would be a shame. Because it's of God. It is his gift to his church. Um, how does this office come to exist today in the world? We shall first of all recall Luther's thinking on this in order then to ask how much of the thing has been taken over by the Lutheran Church in our confessions. Luther had a two-sided battle, the battle between the Romans and the spiritualists, or the Schwermer, he called them. Just as his doctrine of the Lord's Supper was a double front against Rome on the one hand, against the sacrifice of the Mass and the false philosophy and theory of transubstantiation, against spiritualism on the other hand, which denied the bodily presence, so in the doctrine of office of the ministry, he directed against Roman doctrine of priesthood and against the undermining of the office of the ministry among the fanatics. And just as Luther's understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Supper can only be understood when we see both its uh, sides, both its sides uh, in their inseparable connection to this, so also both sides of his doctrine of the office must be directly in view of in order to portray it correctly. 130. Now, what he means here, I think, is the fact that as Luther talked about against Rome in the early days, he talked a lot about the priesthood of the baptized, or the royal priesthood. He never uses the term, by the way, of priesthood believers, 
which I think is rather important. Now, when he later on addressing the spiritualists, he never refers to it except maybe once in the latter years. We have given this office such a ranking that we've given it kind of a, a position of a task within the church. The priesthood of believers means that laymen must go out and do ministry. And there we confuse the matters because what do you mean by ministry? And so one of the most uh, dangerous books ever written in the Missouri Synod's history was 1974, Every Member of Minister by Oscar Feucht. I'm sorry to have to say that, but I think it was a very dangerous book in terms of trying to espouse the idea that the layman could do anything. And so we have now the questioning of the whole practice that came into light in that day, the practice that was never there in the 30s or 40s, as far as I recall, of laymen assisting a Holy Communion. Now why? Or laymen serving their pastor Holy Communion. Now why? We always had the practice of self-communion, not in the Missouri Synod, of course. Oh no, Luther had it in his rights. The pastor would commune himself. Why not? Well, because he couldn't uh, objectively look at himself and say, are you, are you ready for this? Luther had no problem with that. So as time went on, we, we became more and more uh, into kind of a modern Protestant mode with regards to these matters. I don't mean here to offend anybody, pastors or elders, where you do this. I don't think it's something we're going to change overnight. I don't think it needs to be changed overnight. I think it's something we should be discussing and asking, why have we done this? And what does it mean in our church? What does it relate to our doctrine? How does it relate to our doctrinal holy office? And so uh, the false distinction between priests and laity lies in the center of the struggle since the time when he wrote to the Christian nobility, Luther did, um, in which he distinguished uh, once the, the new the doctrine of the general priesthood of believers and which found the widest dissemination of the church. And what is this priesthood of believers? And it means that we have an ontological state. We are like the baptized. We are baptized. We are priests. It states the phenomenon of what we are, who we are, not what we do. It's not a matter of doing. From that time forward, he tirelessly established the exegetical facts of the New Testament. He wrote in 1533 in his private mass, consecration of the priest, that the Holy Spirit has, in the New Testament, diligently prevented the name sacrados, priest or cleric, from being given even to an apostle or to several other, other offices, but it's solely the name of the baptized of the Christian is a hereditary name into which one is born through baptism. For none is born of an apostle, preacher, teacher, or pastor through baptism, but we are all born simply as priests and uh, clerics. So I was very pleased to hear that Pastor Ollendorf was not going to be baptizing his grandson this weekend. He is not uh, baptized to his name or by him. That's another matter. The New Testament in this knows only a double priesthood, the high priesthood of Christ Jesus and the priesthood of the holy people of God and uh, in times. Jesus aspires the royal priesthood of the church. Luther found, fought against the fanatics, however, because they drew a completely different conclusion from the general priesthood, namely the abolition of the office of the ministry altogether. When Karlstadt renounced his title of doctor and desired only to be a layman, when the fanatical Schwermerei sneaks on clandestine preachers, against which the Luther wrote in 1531, forced themselves into congregations upon a called and claimed the right to free, uh, excuse me, right to free proclamation of God's word on the basis of the general priesthood. Then Luther most emphatically emphasized the divine institution 
of the preaching office, the ministerium ecclesiarum, which may be exercised only by one who has been properly called. The call gives the devil great pain, he says, but the devil has his greatest joy in the sneaky and secret preachers. That's Luther for you. So um, there's kind of the background of why is we have the problem today. We have the problem in the church because we didn't remain faithful to Luther and the confessions. We allowed ourselves to become more inclined to look at it in a reform way, not even Schleiermacher's way. And this began to add to the whole phenomena. Luther's institution, of it's not a particular ordering of the Old Testament, we can have any order, was forsaken. We began to have more congregational orders or church, uh, state church orders. And they always threw things off. And then we come to the fact that today we have a great institution, a great gift of God to us. And it's been so maligned, it's been so hurt by the people, by the men themselves. Uh, Sasa had a sermon about the crisis in the ministry. And I was hoping we'd be able to hear that today because I go out and I minister into the parishes and I see a lot of men who are hurting terribly because they're, they're being misunderstood, they're trying to be faithful to word and sacrament and it's not appreciated. And that's why it's very blessed to hear about Pastor Ollendorf, whose ministry is so appreciated. But um, having said that, it's expected that that's going to happen because, you know, we had Moses who said, oh, he said, God, he said, I can't take your call. I don't have eloquence. God says, I will be there with you. Jeremiah said the same thing. Oh, I can't talk because I can't speak. God said, I will be there with you. It goes on and on. All these men in crisis situation. But God said, I will be there with you. And what else could they say? They had to go, because God was going to be with them. And he was going to be there to protect them in the way that he's only given a promise to one institution. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. That's the greatest promise that God has given to any institution. And because of that, our men will faithfully preach and be heard, and God's church will grow. It may not grow dramatically, it may have setbacks, but it will still be under the faithfulness of those men. God's church and blessing to his people. And that's the great thing that we want to hear about today. The blessings that God gives to his people to the pastors and to the faithful laymen who hear that word and marvel at God's given such authority among men to forgive sins. That's the greatest gift that God has given to us to forgive our sins which gives to your pastors. I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Now we're going to give our panel a chance to ask or respond to some of your uh, statements there, and we'll start with Kenneth, and then we'll just work all the way down. Thank you. <laughs> For, wanting, me to, wanting me to start the questions of, from the teacher, that makes me nervous. But uh, just you're, you're commenting about how we need to stick with the Lutheran understanding, which is defined, well, is obtained from scripture but defined by the by the book of concord uh, had an occasion just this past week and asked you to comment on this response of my pastor to a, a methodist lady i'd gone to visit her first and, and left her a little document that quoted a uh, book of concord on what the law and gospel was and you know one of those standing in the doorway so i didn't get to talk very long, but pastor went by and she asked him, she said, well, what do you, the church, what do you do about the, the changes or the differences in cultures and the modern movements and the new developments that are going on, you know, in society? And pastor's answer, I wasn't there to hear it, but it was along the lines of, 
where we go by God's word and he's hard to trump. He's God's to word trump. is hard to trump. Uh -huh, yeah. You cannot trump it. So that was his answer to her. And she showed up in church the next Sunday and we hope she'll be taking instructions starting today. Good, good. Marvelous. Is that kind of what you, if I had to just in a few words, try to... Uh, Four words, right? You put cannot what you were trump God. Today. I think that's pretty good. Pretty good. You cannot trump God. And there are people who try all the time, but uh, I don't think they succeed, do they? That's very good. Really, it's. It was doing a study recently about uh, a phrase I'd heard from a pastor brother-in-law. The uh, the divine. Divine mode of, of being, and I got involved with some words that weren't in, in scripture. Or in this, but the idea of God is transcendental. In other words, He's beyond our understanding. Uh -huh. So how can anybody possibly tell what He's like except to listen to what He says He is? Mm -hmm. And that you can't trump. Mm -hmm. But he has said what he is. That's the important thing for I us. I mean, to that's know. the only way. No one was there when he created. That's right, exactly. So, yes. so I think what you're saying when, when, uh, with just some of my notes in here, you said that justification was the prime teaching, mm -hmm. and that is God's doing, yes, and not of our own. And so, there's nothing we could do except accept. That's right, exactly. And and God's promises are yes in Christ. That's right, exactly. Very well said. Mm -hmm. I was trying to review your, your 45 minutes <laughs> one question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Feuerhahn. Uh, you relieved me when I forgot to pray before Bible class. The Holy Spirit was still there. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Uh, I wondered if you would distinguish for us a little more the difference between the concept of the hidden church and the invisible church. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. Yes, I did. <laughs> exactly. And I kind of wish that they hadn't, but uh, no, because um, you know it's one of those things that uh, you know some people. Salsa is very good at this. You bring something up, you say, "Oh, good, we're gonna have the explanation." He leaves it utterly flat. Doesn't say another thing. I remember when I read about his critique of the Eucharistic prayer, the service book and hymnal, in 1958 of the ALC and the LCA. Oh, good, he's going to critique this now. And then he just left the matter. He just said, it's wrong, and left it there. And so um, Luther's uh, hidden God in the church is kind of like the hidden God everywhere. God is hidden. He does not reveal himself in, except to his re revelation. He's not there in life. He's not there in the everyday world. Now, um, the church is an institution that is hidden, basically, I mean, we don't see its holiness. It is at the same time holy and sinful, like you and I are both justified and sinful. When we look at the church, we can see its sinfulness very clearly. We know the people and what they're like, and, but God sees it and he sees it as holy. And this is hidden to our eyes. It's a matter of faith, not of sight. Luther makes that point. And uh, so the hiddenness is there, but the invisible and the visible Kind of like um, the hidden does not have its opposite so clear as the visible and invisible. The visible church is one that, uh, well, in fact, Walter went on to say the true visible church even. And that even gets more kind of that problem. The, uh, the hidden, the, the visible and invisible, is as if we must see something. Hidden is not a matter of seeing so much, but of believing. I think this may be where the problem is, really. It's in the matter of sight or of, of, uh, of believing. That's about as good as I can do right now. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you for the question. I have to think more about that. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Feuerhahn, uh, could you uh, explain or uh, the uh, distinction that we make between the office of the keys and the office of the holy ministry? 
Is that merely a semantic distinction or does the distinction run deeper? What does the catechism say about the office of the keys? <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And uh, it's God, He gives it through the office of ministry. That's the way in which it's, it's there for us. It's not only there through that, in other words, we can forgive one another. There are kind of seven ways in which we give forgiveness, as it were. There's the um, privately before God in prayer, the um, general confession for the divine service. There's the um, way in which we can go to a brother and say, I've sinned against you and I need your forgiveness. We can go to a third party and say, I've sinned against Ralph over there and I need your, you to announce to me God has forgiven me. We can go to the pastor, which is one of the highest forms. Highest, what does that mean? Well, that's another matter. I'll go into that later. But then there's the public announcement of you know, I've sinned before God in this assembly, and you want to say that, and I forget what the seventh is, but anyway, these are all ways in which God has done that, but um, he's given to us to forgive and have received his forgiveness. They're all valid. The one of the holy office, though, is one that he He wants us to know that this is, as God has given, so it is in heaven, so it is on earth. It's a great gift. That's why it's so great and gratifying that the younger pastors there are encouraging in the private institution of confession and absolution. Many of our lay people feel very uncomfortable with that, and so they should. It's calling them to repentance, I guess, but that's all right. If they don't feel comfortable with it, well, then so be it. We hope that there will be another generation that will feel more and more comfortable with it, and it can be done for them. It's a great gift to God to his people.